Good afternoon and welcome to Groves Academy January Admissions Virtual Information Session. I am Kim Ani. I am the Transitions Advocate here at Groves Academy. I welcome all of you. I know we have a few more coming in. My role today is to act as facilitator. So I will take the questions that you are curious about or want to ask us and direct them to our panelists. The way that you do this is to float your mouse to the bottom of your screen. You'll see a Q&A bubble start to appear. You can type in your question, and then we will get to that question as we move through our webinar. We have a hard stop at one o'clock today, uh, and I know we have quite a few people here that have a lot of questions, so we are gonna get going. To start out, I'd like to introduce our panel. Our panelists today are students, parents, and administrative staff here at Groves Academy. I'm gonna start out with uh, Dan Morgan, president of Groves. Dan? Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us today to learn all about the heart and soul of Groves Learning Organization, which is of course Groves Academy. We're so excited for you to uh, listen and learn from the parents, from students and from our team. Thanks for making some time for us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dan. Next, we will have Ms. Peoples introduce herself. Kim? I am Kim Peoples, head of school at Groves Academy. I'm also very fortunate to be a former Groves parent. My son is in his second year as a college student and welcome. And we're so happy that you're here with us today. Thank you, Ms. Peoples. Uh, next, uh, Director of Curriculum, Ellen. Hi, everybody. It's, uh, thank you very much for coming today. My name is Ellen Engstrom. I'm the Director of Curriculum. Um, I've been at Groves for a long time. I've been a teacher, a division director, and an administrator here. And so I love to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Next, we'll start to look at our admissions team. Abby? Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Abby Kirschbaum. I'm our admissions coordinator. And in my role, I help guide families through the application process and through visit dates. Thank you, Abby. And our director of admissions, Erica. Hi, thank you for being with us today. My name is Erica Sutton. I'm the director of admissions. And I'm usually the kind of first person you speak with when you're thinking about um, applying to Groves Academy. And I'm also the person that kind of, again, with Abby, helps you through the admissions process and helps you find if we're the right place. So again, thank you for joining today. Thanks, Erica. And next, our, our best, best panelists that we have, our parents and students. I'm gonna start with uh, Libby. Libby? Hi, I'm Libby, and I am the current parent of a fifth grader at Groves who's been there. This is his fourth year, and I'm happy to answer questions from the parent perspective. Thank you, Libby. Next, uh, Amy. Hi, I'm Amy, and um, my son is here on the panel as well. And um, I was in your shoes uh, less than three years ago, and I'm very happy to be here to field any questions on uh, this panel for me back then was, was very impactful in the decision-making process. Thanks for sharing that, Amy. And our other parent is Shauna. Hi, my name is Shauna Headland, and I have two kiddos at Groves, one in fifth grade and one in eighth grade. The fifth graders knew there this year and third grade graders been there for three years. Happy to be here. Thank you. And of course, our students. Wilder, can you introduce yourself? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Wilder Stinson. I'm an eighth grader and I'm Shauna Headland's um, son. Very good. And then Henry. Hi, I'm Henry Brisbane. I am a 10th grader and this is my third year here at Groves and Amy Brisbane is my mother. Very nice of you to introduce your parents too. Thank you, students. So I'm going to repeat um, that I'm Kim Ani, Transitions Advocate here at Groves Academy. My role is as facilitator to direct questions to our panelists. To ask questions, we ask that you float your mouse to the bottom of your screen. There is a Q&A bubble. If you click on that, you're able to type in a question, and then we will get to your questions as we move through. I do have one question that we want to ask our families, most importantly. Why is Groves different? from other schools. 
I will start, we'll go with the youngest on up to the oldest. So we'll start with parents and then move to our students. Uh, Libby? Um, we found Grove to be different than um, our other school experiences in the individualized approach to learning. Um, it's just such a systematic way of how they teach is so special and unique and has really helped our son not only in his academic learning but also in his confidence and his social and emotional learning. Thank you, Libby. Next, we'll go to Shauna. I have to really agree that um, self-confidence really blooms at um, Groves and I think that has a lot to do with individualized support um, and the small class size and um, the support around executive functioning so that kids have self-efficacy and they, they know what to do and they can fulfill it. Um, I appreciate that there's less responsibility on parents for their academic support so that you can really be the parent that you wanna be and let those skilled teachers assist them with their academic work and their progress. Um, and it's good for kids to be in an environment with other kids um, that have the same strengths as them and uh, people who know how, how special they are. Thank you, Shauna. Amy, your turn. Hi, yeah, uh, so when um, when my son was in grade school, I think we saw a gap between how smart he is and how well he was doing in school. And that gap increased dramatically when he hit middle school and his confidence tanked. And we had um, some things in place in the public school, but it wasn't enough. Um, Groves Academy, uh, met Henry where he is, sees him as a whole person, and the other teacher certainly pointed out a couple of things in terms of executive functioning. Um, and, you know, the question, I think that um, kids like my son sometimes can think, what's wrong with me? And really, there was a book that was part of a book club that we had a couple of years ago, and in the book, someone talked about, you don't have dyslexia, they have dystichia. And that sums up a lot of, of how I felt about my son's public school experience. Thank you, Amy, very much for sharing that. Wilder, I'll repeat the question for the students. Um, what is, why is Groves different from other schools? Wilder? At other schools, I felt like the oddball and I didn't feel like I fit in. Here, I, I have friends and they're all at the same level as me and they all respect me for who I am. Thank you, Wilder and Henry. Um, at other schools, they kind of, as everyone else said, they kind of failed me and made me feel left out and different. But at Groves, everyone just doesn't really care about, like they care, but they're like, oh, just because you have a learning difficulty doesn't mean I'm going to ostracize you and push you out you know because of that learning difficulty we're going to be really good friends and we're going to get along thank you for sharing that henry so we have a question about carpool options uh, i'm going to turn to someone in admissions are there carpool options available uh, erica I see you nodding your head you want to take that question please Yes, so many of our families do carpool to Groves. Um, when you are admitted to Groves um, in the summer before you start at Groves, um, one of our office administrators, Amy Luffy, um, will work with parents putting out a survey to see if you are interested in carpooling. And if you are, she will then assist you in connecting with other people in your area in hopes to um, build a carpool. Um, so the answer is many parents will carpool and we will do our best to assist you in finding someone to carpool. Of course, we can't guarantee, but we're hopeful that would be a good option. Thanks, Erica. I have a question for our students. Does my son need a laptop at Groves? I'm going to start. Well, one of you could probably answer this. Let's start with Henry. Does their child need to bring a laptop to Groves? Uh, no, they will be given one. And it's actually really sweet. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. And then Wilder, you have your own laptop, correct? Yeah. 
middle school, lower school, and upper school, they all get their own laptops and they're very nice and you can bring them home and use them for homework and any assignments you have. Thank you, Wilder. And Libby, in the lower school environment, does your students uh, bring their laptop back and forth or is it only used in school? What's been your experience? Um, our experience has been this past year, our son has kept his uh, laptop at school, but last year with um, the potential for it going remote, which it really rarely went remote, um, they were bringing it back and forth. Okay, thank you so much, Libby. I have a question, Ms. Peoples, um, about discipline policies specific to classroom interruptions and bullying. The question is, what are our discipline pol policies? Would you like to speak to that, please? Absolutely. We look at each student as an individual, first and foremost. Now, certainly we don't tolerate um, bullying. We don't tolerate disrespect. Uh, and certainly we respect, we expect every student, every adult in the building to treat each other with respect. And we certainly have policies across the board that um, uphold treating each other with respect, treating each other with honor, and we have a zero tolerance for bullying. But we also look at every situation on a case-by-case -case basis, um, on an individual basis, and we uh, channel and we assign our discipline and we assign um, whatever consequences specific to that case. Thank you, Ms. Peoples. I have a question for admissions. Um, and then if students, I know Amy shared a little bit about this in her introduction. If students or parents want to add on, we'll, we'll take that. The question is, my son has failed many classes this year, 10th grade. How would this be addressed at Groves? Public schools have failed him. Um, can we start with Erica on that and what that looks like from an admissions perspective? And then if any parents would like to add on to that, just let me know. So it's frequent, especially when a student is joining us in upper school, that they maybe have um, had some failing grades in the past. So we're looking at that during the admissions process to make sure that we can support that student and get them on a path to graduation because we start to get into looking at if they have the correct credits. Um, we are very blessed at Groves to have a wonderful upper school counselor who is really wonderful at making sure that we're able to get that student what they need, um, thinking outside the box if we need to, getting credit recovery on, on, you know, underway if need be. And so we would absolutely determine um, if we can support and what the plan would be as part of the admissions process. Okay, thank you, Erica. Um, would any of the parents or even students want to add on to that question? Or do you feel like that we're done? Amy? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the my guess is that one of the common denominators of the experience that that school failed my kid is my child was stressed out. He, he or she wasn't sure how to learn in this certain situation. There's a gap between what they know and what they can express that they know. Um, standardized tests are not always a good option and some other assessment tools that work in a standard classroom aren't an option. And I think that Gross does a very good job of closing that gap. I mean, our situation is a little different in that um, we don't have a transcript, a high school transcript from public schools with those grades. Um, so I guess it's be more talking to the admissions coordinators about when it comes to your child's future and what the, that high school record looks like, if you will. But the gap between what my son knows and how he can perform in the class has really closed. And I think that, that you know, the first thing I think is that, again, that stress level can be so high for anybody in middle school and high school. And then when you have learning differences on top of that, it's just a vicious cycle, downward spiral that keeps going on and on. And my tour at Groves, God, my first impression was like, it feels so calm here. I mean, there just wasn't that stressed energy in, in the hallways and in the small classrooms. And just, I think that as soon as after they, after each kid gets acclimated, they know that I, I hope and believe that the kids know that they're supported, they're where they need to be in order to succeed 
um, both executive functioning, uh, confidence to be a lifelong learner, and academics. Thank I have you. something to add to that, Kim. Yes, Ellen. Um, I, I think one thing that's important um, and one thing that, that really works well for our, our students is you know, the fact that there are, there's a lot of ways to show knowledge. And um, so I think our, our teachers in general are, you know, really are flexible for one thing and, um, and, and also try to um, devise uh, different ways that students can show what they know. So it isn't always just an essay or a test or something like that so that it, it so that students have an opportunity to show knowledge through powerpoints through posters through other kinds of media video and so on that i think um you know that i think is um i think is really beneficial for a number of reasons it it allows students to use a method a use a a, a way of showing knowledge that they're more comfortable with and also um, uh, builds their confidence that yeah I you know I I'm smart I can show I I can do this um, so thank you Ellen very much I have a question for Abby um, Abby what are the grade population sizes and classroom sizes student to teacher ratio yeah so I just pulled up my list right now of the grades so are we the most students in seventh grade about or 42 students we actually have a really big graduating class this year too we have 27 um but it ranges from about 15 to, to 40 per grade. Um, but I will say in all of our divisions, our classes are not um, created only by grade, even in lower school. So all our ratio is about one to eight. So most classes have in lower school have uh, uh, eight students and one teacher. If a classroom has 10 students, it'll have two instructors. Um, and then in middle school and upper school, most classes are also about one to eight, sometimes maybe nine or 10, um, but that is a rarity. Thank you, Abby. And along those lines, Ellen, I have a question for you. Um, Abby did a nice job explaining uh, that they're not uniform, they are just determined by student needs, but how do we create our classroom groupings, Ellen? And I know it's different between divisions. Let's mm -hmm. get lower school, I think, primarily. Sure. Um, well, a lot of thought goes into creating class groupings in lower school. So, um, I, you know, clearly we're not going to put kids in wildly different, we're not going to put, you know, sixth graders with third graders, obviously, or, any, or something, but we tend to group, uh, we do tend to have uh, multi-grade groupings. So there might be a fifth, sixth grade class, a, a fourth, fifth, third, Fourth, etc. Um, and but uh, what we do, we look at um, a number of things. We look at um, we do look at academic levels. We look at you know at achievement. We also look at developmental um, developmental stages, um, social and emotional factors. And we try to create a group where of students who will. Um, we'll be able to relate to one another, support one another, um, and also uh, be able to learn together. Um, and so we look at, you know, various factors in their learning uh, profiles too. So it's a real, um, it's a real mixture of, um, of variables really that we consider when we put a class group together. And I should add too that in lower school, we group uh, students in reading, uh, in learning, reading, spelling, and also in math by the level where they are. So a student may leave a classroom to go get reading instruction at in another with another teacher because then we'll make those groups very cohesive based on their level and um, you know and other learning factors, um, and the same for math. But they, um, but their home group is um, will be where they have writing, literature, and social studies and science together. 
Thank you, Ellen. I have a question, I have a question for uh, Ms. Peoples. Uh, what was our mode or is our mode of teaching during the high wave of, wave of COVID-19 uh, still in person, distance learning, and do students have options to meet with their teachers? We can give the students the, uh, that question, but talk a little bit about how we've handled that. Well, our current mode of learning is in person and through the highways and byways of COVID, our preferred method and our, our in practice method of, of learning has been in person. Uh, we know for our students and really for all students, the best method is in person, but certainly we don't ignore the science. We don't ignore what's happening around us and we will switch to the mode that will keep us safe. Uh, but first and foremost, if at all possible, we're going to stay in person. Um, we have uh, uh, practices and we have things in place that will keep us safe from our HVAC system to our cleaning processes that we have in place in our classrooms from our mandated mask wearing to following social distancing protocols to just being a community that values each other uh, and values our safety. Um, we, we follow all sorts of protocols that have kept us safe, thank goodness. And that's within the school and across the organization. And Dan can certainly add to that as well. Anything to add, Dan? Well, oh, actually, Tim, I think you covered it perfectly. Uh, we will do everything we can to stay in person, uh, and, uh, but we're always gonna balance that with the health and safety of every single human being who comes through our doors. Thank you. So the other part of that question was about um, when we were in distance learning, I think that was where it was directed and our students' ability to connect with teachers. But I would like each of our students to talk about, um, you know, we're in person, talk about your relationship with teachers and connecting with them. And then I'll ask our parents the same thing from the parent perspective. So um, let's start with Henry, talk a little bit about connecting with teachers and what that is like for you in the upper school. Um, so, Connecting with teachers is, it varies on the teacher, but all in all, the teachers just love to talk about personal life. It doesn't matter. They just want to get to know the students, get to know you better. In class, they will try their best because they have seven other students to help, but they will try their best to adapt to what helps you better. Like with me, I'm kind of a visual learner. And so some of my teachers will just be like, here's a picture of what we're doing. And then they'll give me some time to try and do it on my own. And they are like really good at telling me, like not in a rude way, but like corrective, like polite correcting, like, oh, you did this wrong. And they know like when and when not kind of to do it. Like when I'm in the zone and when I'm just kind of, oh, I'm just here ready to learn. Henry, thanks for sharing that. Any thoughts about that Wilder and your interactions with your middle school teachers? Um, my teachers are also my friends and they're all really nice and wanna help you any way possible. Thank you, Wilder. And parents, um, any thoughts about communication with teachers, your interactions with teachers? Uh, I see Shauna's gone off mute. Let's start with Shauna. Yeah, I remember as a new parent at, um, at Groves, I was remaining as involved as I had been as when my kiddos were at in a public school classroom. And the teachers had to kind of, I realized I needed to learn how to be a parent at Groves. And not only did my kid need to learn how to be a student at Groves and um, that they were attending to um, Wilder who started there first um, so closely and that I could um, kind of release myself from the duty of advocate because they were advocating from the classroom for him which was just such a sigh of relief. And, um, and um, I've kind of learned now how to be a parent at Groves and let the magic in the classroom happen. And uh, communication is really easy. 
Um, I also realized that I was so used to kind of defending and standing up for my kids that I had to realize that the reason that they might, for instance, tell me my kiddo was tired in class that day was because they cared about them and because they were looking for solutions for them, not because they were being critical and they wanted me to do something better at home. Um, so it is, it is really warm. I also noticed that when we were thinking about transition, um, I immediately, like, as soon as I was thinking about going back into a different school, my hackles kind of went up again. And then I realized that there was a transition advocate. I did not even know this. And we've been, gotten so much support um, that I just have confidence in the whole process. Thanks, Shauna. Anything to add? Amy, it looks like you went off mute. Yeah, so we, I can only speak to the um, middle school and upper school experience, but one of the core functions of the teachers at Groves is executive functioning, and it's integrated in all of the classes in eighth grade. And then in high school, there is a dedicated executive functioning teacher. And um, <laughs> both years, my son really resonated with the teacher, and I think that what was taught in the EF class was amazing. And the fact that all of the teachers kind of use that as the foundation of working well with these, with a, a child. If, if, if something's going wrong someday, that it's, it's an executive functioning issue. So, you know, oh, are you having a problem sitting still? Well, maybe it works for you to pace in the back of the classroom. Can we figure out a way that you can get your wiggles out? You're not bothering me or distracting me. And you're not distracting the other students. And they just do that all the time. I mean, what can we do to make sure that you can be in, in the zone in learning? And um, um, just another example I wanna say is that, I, um, um, if it's okay for, for me to share this about math for you, Henry, you were in the gap between um, middle school and high school, you were either going to kind of repeat a class and be bored, or you were gonna get into the next level and it may be too much of a stretch, or the teacher offered to be a tutor for you during the summer. And I just thought that was extraordinary. Thanks for sharing that, Amy. Um, anything to add, Libby, or cover it pretty well? Go ahead. Um, it was covered really well. I really uh, agree with what Shauna said about learning how to be a parent at Groves. I had never really thought about it, but it is, you, you can take a step back a little bit and you're still going to be an advocate for your child, but you know that the teachers at Groves are advocating for them. And the communication has been fabulous. Um, if you email your student's teacher, they've always gotten back to me within that day. Um, one year I had a teacher that gave me weekly phone calls, um, just updating, brainstorming, working together on things. So um, the staff and teachers at Groves are fantastic. We feel very grateful to be there. Thank you. Um, Henry and Wilder, there's a question about uh, prom was mentioned. Uh, and I know it's a little different uh, in our COVID environment than it had been pre-COVID. So along that line, I'm gonna ask both students a question about, um, Henry, you specifically about prom, if we have one, I know the answer. And then also any extra activities you're involved in here at Groves outside of the classroom. I'm gonna start with Henry. Um, so I've heard rumors that there may be a prom depending on which way COVID goes right now. And any extra act, like curriculars, right now I am not in any, but I have heard from a lot of my friends that theater is really fun to do. It's part of a community. You get to hang out with your friends after school. Caribou has been a big talk. Um, then I've heard being on the sports team one of my best friends right now is on the basketball team. And I've seen him play. That guy looks so happy when he's with his friends shooting hoops. And I'm not on any. I want to, but I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between what I want to do. But if you do join extracurricular activities, like automatically from what I've heard, you get incorporated and you're part of the family. 
And it just sounds like a lot of fun. Thank you, Henry. Wilder, have you been involved in extra activities outside of the classroom? And what are they? Um, currently, I'm in something called GAS, which sounds funny, but it's Groves Academy Ski and Snowboard, which every Thursday we go and we'll grab our ski stuff from the gym and we'll go to a ski hill. And it's something that I can always look forward to. And it's something that always makes me happy. And if something's hard for me, I'll just think about, well, if I get through it, I have this to look forward to. And it's a very fun thing to do. And the teachers will help you if you have homework that day, teachers will help you get done with it. And so extracurricular studies and stuff, they don't, they're not as much outside of school as the teachers and your friends will try to help you with it. So you can stay on top of all the stuff you need to do. Thank you. And Dan, you had something you wanted to add there. Go ahead. Uh, I just feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Groves has a state champion trap shooting team. Uh, and it's been a big deal for a number of years. Uh, we got a big trophy this year, this past year. Uh, and I just got to put in a plug for the, for the state champs. <laughs> Dan, thank you very much. Yeah, I had never heard of trap shooting until uh, being here at Groves. That is a big deal at our school. And we even have students as they transition out of Groves that want to participate in it too. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. And your students might start to ask you about that if they are indeed coming into Groves next fall. Yeah, I just want to add too that, um, you know, uh, that in a, bef before we had COVID and we had a lot of restrictions, we had a very active after school activities program with a lot of choices for students in, uh, you know, in the arts, in uh, yoga, in chess. There are a number of things that we did which we're not able to do because of, um, because of the restrictions that COVID has placed on it. But I know that um, at some point it'll be back. It will, we want it back, right? Um, Henry, I have a question about homework in high school. How much homework do you get? So it varies. Right now it is, the end of the semester is coming up. So we're getting like final assignments and all of that fun stuff. But the teachers are really good at communicating with one another. And so right now I have like, I had math homework to do, and then I had a history assignment that I need to get done. But my math teacher is like, okay, you can do the history and I'll like give you an extension on the math homework. And so with homework, it varies, but all in all, they're really good at talking and making sure that you have as, not as little as possible, but not enough to stress someone out to the point of like, they just don't end up doing it. Cause that's what happened to me at my old school. My teachers would just put so much homework on me. And then my anxiety just kind of made me just fall apart. And now once I came to girls, I'm like, I, 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 I can do this. This feels really good. Thank you, Henry. Wilder, um, homework in the middle school. Uh, can you share a little bit about what that looks like for you? I've always strongly disliked homework. And I think my teachers know that and they're trying to help me like be more okay with doing it. And my, the teachers, like Henry said, they communicate with each other. So you'll never have too much homework. Also, because of the small class sizes, they can fit your homework exactly to how much you need and exactly to like how, what will help you. And it's just nice to know that I won't have a 
bunch of homework this day. And like, so I don't have to worry about that because I know my teachers will help me if I bring it up to them. Thank you, Wilder. And Libby, as a lower school parent, your perspective on homework. Um, the homework has, they have these wonderful planners. I don't know if they have that in middle school as well, but in the lower school, um, the kids are learning how to plan their day and they have um, reading logs and math logs that they fill out and we sign at the end of the week. So my son now as a fifth grader can plan Say, for instance, he has um, sports one night and he knows he's not going to get into get be able to get all of his uh, homework done. He can plan ahead or, you know, front load for the week. So it's really at, in fifth grade now it's on his his shoulders and he's been able to um, figure it out. Um, and it's the homework that's just right for him. Thank you, Libby. Um, so we have quite a few admissions questions. I'm gonna bounce them back and forth between Abby and Erica. I'm gonna start with Abby and I hope we get all of these in because there's, there's a lot of overlapping on these. Um, so one parent's question is, um, what is our timeline they, uh, and our acceptance rate? So what's our timeline for admissions and our acceptance rate? They're a little worried about getting their hopes up. Abby, you wanna start with that? Yeah, so applications have been open since October, but this is a great time to apply if you haven't yet and you're thinking about it. So we have um, an application that your first first you would talk to us. You would have a, a long conversation with Erica and talk about you know what. Um, are your child's needs and what does our school do and would we be able to support them? Um, and once you have that conversation, if it seems like this would be a possible fit, we would send you an application. You would fill out that application. You would need to include a neuropsych report, which could be a, a diagnostic or an IEP evaluation, include any IEP or 504 plans. Um, you would include um, the most recent um, report card, as well as if they're in high school, a, a transcript, an official transcript, um, and then you would provide teacher or tutor and excuse me, teacher and tutor feedback forms that you would send over to teachers and tutors, and they would send directly to us. So once once all of that is complete, we will move it to review, and within a couple weeks, we will do a review of the application. If we think it's that application is still a fit, it will go to visit day. Um, our visit days are beginning in, around next month, beginning of February. Fingers crossed, everything is good. Um, so we will, um, once the student is able to come in for a visit day, they will visit our classrooms, have a full day in school. Um, and then within two to three weeks after that, we can give you a, uh, an acceptance uh, if, if it is, continues to be a fit. Um, an acceptance rate, I'm gonna throw that to Erica just because I think she might have a better, a better number. Sounds good, Erica. Yeah. Typically our acceptance rate at Groves is between about 70 and 80%. And part of that is because we are having those in-depth conversations on the front end to make sure that we may be a fit even before you apply. So if you are invited to apply, um, you know that means that through our info search, we feel like we might be a fit and we want to dig deeper with you. Um, so again, usually between 70 and 80% of students who apply are accepted. Thank you very Thank you much, very much. Erica. Um, the other question, and I, I think you addressed this pretty well, but if you wanna add anything, Erica, how would we know if our students' struggles with school are the type that Groves can address? Do you wanna add anything in on that? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, if you're uncertain, call. Get on our calendars, have a nice conversation with us, and we can absolutely, you know, gather information and help you determine if we may be a right fit. But generally, you know, the students that we serve at Groves are students with language-based learning disorders like dyslexia and dysgraphia, for example. Um, many of our students also have and or have ADHD. Um, we aren't always a best fit for students who have um, severe emotional or behavior concerns. Um, we aren't always the best fit for students who are on the autism spectrum as we lack um, specific knowledge and personnel for that. Um, we also are not usually a good fit for students that are severely, um, or I should say are lower on the cognitive 
um, scale. Um, but we do serve a wide breadth of students. And so again, if in doubt, call, and we will help you determine if your child might be a fit. Erica, thank you so much. Okay, I have a question for Wilder. You might have to think back a bit and we can help you out if you need it. What does the schedule of a sixth grader look like, Wilder? And do you have time for recess? Yes, you have time for recess. I remember that the schedule, I remember you go to school. The next thing is Wilson, which is kind of like reading. And then math and science afterwards. I can't really remember it very well. So. Nope, that's, that's very accurate. So a Wilder is described is a, uh, a typical lower school student's schedule during the day. Our school starts at 8.25 in the morning and ends at 3 p.m. Um, so now, Wilder, what I'd like you to do is put your middle school hat on, and then I'll turn to Henry. What is your middle school schedule like? What do you start out with each day? So you start out with advisory, and you like check your emails, plug in your computer, make sure everything's in your backpack, and um, and then you'll go to first hour, and then second hour, and then there's a break, which is our recess and after that it's third and fourth usually in third and fourth you have your elective and then and then lunch after lunch is fifth and sixth and then you have afternoon advisory which means uh, um, you check your planners make sure you have all the homework you need to do know where everything is and you get ready to go home Excellent. That is a middle school day. Henry, what's different in the upper school with your day? Other start and stop times are the same, but what does your day look like, Henry? Um, so first and second hour are upper school's elective times. And then you have, after second hour, you have a break exactly like middle school. So our break times line up, which is actually really helpful because it's not much of a change there. Then you have third hour and fourth hour. And then you have something called a oh, win block, which is what I need. And that gives you time to ask your teachers to help you on homework, get work done if you need. And on so Mondays and Tuesdays are dedicated study hall win blocks and sorry no Monday and Wednesday Monday and Wednesday are dedicated study hall win blocks and then Tuesdays and Thursdays are club activities so you can do walking club you can just go to the gym club activities are just times to hang out with your friends and talk but you can also go to study hall and get your homework done so there's when, then you have lunch, then you have fifth and sixth hour, and then I skip morning advisory. You have morning advisory, and then you have um, afternoon advisory, which is, it's the same as middle school. You just, well, I'm not, I don't really remember middle school, but we get our planners checked. We talk with friends, June, uh, junior and seniors are allowed to leave early and drive. And if they drive, they can just hop in their car and drive home. And yeah. Excellent description of your day. Um, so I hope that answer. There's a question about study hall too. And I can say in the middle school, if a student uh, has something they need to get done and it's decided that finishing it during um, any of their advisory times or something like that is better than getting outside. They do that, but we also know that many of our students just need to get out. So we weigh that very carefully. The next question is from Ms. Peoples um, in this around college. Do many Grove students go on to college? 
And uh, if you're not sure about the transcript question, I can handle that. But if transcripts are different at Groves, how does that affect college military application? Ms. Peebles? Yes, uh, we have the, our largest graduating class uh, from Groves uh, graduating this year, 27, and a number of our students have already been accepted to four-year institutions. And just speaking from a personal experience as a, a, a Groves parent, my son is in his second year at um, Augsburg University. So he's a sophomore and he's just uh, starting his uh, second semester. Uh, had a great first semester. One class is a little rocky, uh, but ended that class well, and he's starting his second semester. And I, I have to say, and there's no bias, even though I'm the head of school, there's still no bias. Uh, a lot of the work that he did in executive functioning, the writing class that he had um, his junior and, and senior year, a lot of the work that he did in preparation um, for just you know making the transition to 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 college at at groves is certainly paying off now if you would have asked him his junior and senior year just like with most high school students yeah whatever but and actually experiencing the uh you know what what it means to be a college student he will tell you okay now i understand you yeah, i get it yes the planning, understanding how to write, how to manage your time, but the most important skill that we talk about all the time, advocating for yourself, knowing how to ask for extended time, getting to know your professors, getting in conversation with your professors, making sure you have the right classes and that you have the right accommodations. These are all the things that you learn at Groves. These are the things that he are carrying over for him at school. So yes, 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 it's working so well. We're very proud of them. In terms of transcript, the transcript that you would have in any high school, and Kim can elaborate on this more, but any high school uh, transcript that you would experience at any other school is the tra same transcript that you have at Groves and easily transferable, that transcript transferred uh, to Oxburg to help him to gain admittance at, at Oxburg. You're correct about the transcript. Our high school students graduate with a transcript that meets all requirements for the Minnesota Department of Education for high school graduation. They earn the credits, the courses line up uh, exactly as they need to for a full high school diploma and transcript if they go on to a post-secondary um, opportunity. So thank you. Oh, and go ahead. I have to say one other thing. He also earned a merit scholarship and a number of our students earned merit scholarships last year and this year going into Oxford. So that's also a possibility as well. And we're making sure that he continues to earn the grades to keep the scholarship. So just know that too. Got smart kids here. We do. We yeah, have very smart kids. I want to mention too. Um, there's a question about advanced math in there. Um, uh, one of the things we do offer for our seniors is PSEO, and if you're unfamiliar with that, parents, that's post-secondary educational opportunity. We um, do every year have seniors participate in post-secondary education. That is taking courses at a community college and then earning college credit for them. What we do that's a little different is we don't let them just fly out the door and attend a community college and hope it goes well. We closely evaluate if a student's a good fit for that first, but then also monitor and assist them. Um, we won't do the work for them, but we do provide the guidance, scaffolding, and structure to help them um, keep up and make sure that they're doing the best that they can in that. There's another question about advanced math. Um, can students go from one group to another depending on his or her academic levels and other skills? Um, Ellen had to depart, she's our curriculum director, and she could probably best answer this, but I can also as a transitions advocate share a little bit about that. Um, for our seniors, we do offer two um, math classes. Uh, one is statistics, and then the other is, oh, the Traeger Calc. I'm not quite sure which one it is, and I'm sorry about that, but um, so they do have that opportunity. <laughs> Freshman, sophomore, junior year, they do, um, we have geometry, algebra, algebra two, 
Ms. Peoples, do you have something to add to help me out with the math? Thank you so much. We, we do offer calc. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I thought, yeah. I um, also know that um, so many of our students come in with language-based challenges. Uh, we do have some eighth graders that take our freshman high school math class. Um, if that is a gift or a strength that they have, and they do earn a high school credit on a transcript from that class. So um, I think you've gotten the message pretty clear too. We're, we're very um, nimble and flexible in meeting your student where they're out at and advancing them in the areas that we know they can advance in and bringing them up in the areas that they need that as well. I hope that answered that question. Um, a good question for admissions. Any specific things we should know about financial assistance or aid? Do you want to take that, Erica? Certainly. Um, so next year, we are budgeted to award $1.75 million in financial aid. And so we encourage all of our families at Groves, new and old, to apply for financial aid if you think you may apply, may um, qualify. And even if you're not sure you'll qualify, we absolutely encourage you to apply to see. Um, financial aid applications will be available once the student's moving on to the visit day stage of our application process. So we will share that information with you throughout the admissions process, help you through that process. It's done with a third party um, system called TADS that many private schools and independent schools in our, our nation use. It's very fair and unbiased. Um, and so what I would say is aid is available to those who need it and qualify, and we will help you apply during the application process so you know what your award may be when you're making enrollment decisions. Thank you so much. But I do have another question along the admissions lines. Do we accept credits earned outside of our school, such as math from the U of M or world language from an online school? I have a feeling the answer is individual, but I'll let you try and tackle that question first. So I think the question is like if you're in high school and wanted to take like a uh, world language outside of school or math with U of M. And so I would say that I know that has been done in the past. Um, we absolutely look at it in an individual basis. And you would work with Michelle Jonas, who is our upper school counselor, as she's the person that makes sure all of the requirements and graduation um, requirements are in place, and she would help facilitate that. But I would say that, you know, we are flexible and we are open to making a lot of things work. Um, so if it, if it makes sense for the student, I'm confident that we would try to make that work. Thank you so much, Erica. Can I add one quick thing to that? Oh, of course you can. Go ahead. Thanks. Just if any family is thinking of doing that or, or has done that in the past, it, it just is important that that class comes from an accredited institution of some kind. It just needs to, and needs to be verified that that's accredited. So that's just kind of a base foundational thing for that. Thank you, Dan. And Amy, you came off mute. Did you have something to add? Yeah, going back to the financial aid question, I think that, that it's much more appropriate than the state lottery. You can't win if you don't play. And uh, we were pleasantly surprised every time we applied for financial aid. The process is helpful. And just a, a tip, go through the same process that you're doing for filing for taxes. It's the same amount of pain. A lot of it is the same questions. And yeah, both the TADs and um, Groves are very helpful with it. I mean, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I do have a question that's more in the transition um, end of things, and then I'll just ask for closing comments uh, as we're getting close to time. The question is about um, how does Groves interact with Minneapolis public schools for transitions into Groves or out of Groves with regard to an IEP? Are new assessments required or redundants eliminated? I feel that we talk quite a bit about required or recommended paperwork that is necessary. Abby and Eric have outlined quite a few things. Um, regarding your student and what is necessary to complete a full application. As far as interacting with Minneapolis public schools, it's no different than any public school district in the state of Minnesota. Um, you know, if you have an IEP, we'd like to take a look at it. If you have an IEP evaluation, that, a 504 accommodation plan, uh, no matter how old the document is or if it has lapsed, let us take a look at it. We'll let you know if it still meets criteria. Most of those documents, though, are considered valid for three consecutive years from the date of evaluation. Um, from a transitions perspective, I do work with families whose path maybe leads them to another place outside of Groves, or we, I help do in deciding if staying at Groves is the best thing for your child and your family. 
Um, I work with families one-on-one -on, -one on trying to figure out if we want to do a reevaluation for an IEP. Uh, that is not required to be at Groves. It's something we look at before you leave Groves. So it's a, a thing that I work with personally with those families and all referrals for reevaluation go through the district of residence that we're in, which is St. Louis Park. Then I work with that family to carry that document on to the next school. So I hope that answered that question. Of course, admissions can guide you a little bit more specifically for your child coming out of Minneapolis or and then what that looks like going back in as well. With that, we have about three minutes. Um, I would like to know what's your favorite thing about Groves. And I'm gonna start with their parents, just that one, one favorite memory or one thing, um, and then I'll move to our students and we'll wrap up. Maybe you went off mute first, you get to go first. Okay, well, I, I have to admit, I asked my son this morning before he went to school, I just briefly told him, hey, I'm gonna be doing this webinar and it's gonna be for potential new families. What would you say about Groves? And this is coming from my fifth grade son. And he said, Groves is amazing. The teachers are really nice and they are very patient. And we have just been, now this is off quote, but we have just been so happy. And um, he now is at the point that his first year, he did not want to go. And now he's at the point three to four years in that he never wants to leave Groves. So we are so happy there. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks for taking the time to ask your son that. Shauna? I'm just going to quote Wilder's little brother, who um, we had a, a day a few weeks ago that it was really cold and icy. We thought maybe there was going to be no school. And we told him that there is a chance of that that evening. And he was like, what? I have to go to school tomorrow. <laughs> and this is a kid who had uh, school adversity for years. He literally walked out of his grade school and came home. Um, so to see that joy in learning for both Wilder and to see them learning, spending so much more time in their assets has been um, just an amazing experience. Thank you, Shauna. Amy, anything to add? Yeah, uh, this is a tough one. Um, but I, I think I would just like to say that um, we, we have our son back and he's delightful. And I think he's got a much better sense of self, what he can bring to the world, um, the knowledge that he does have. And um, yeah, we weren't, we were, um, he certainly didn't have that with the environment in the public school. And I just, I really appreciate all the connections he's had with the other students and the teachers and staff at Groves and, and they've just been really, really helpful. Thank you, Amy. Okay, Wilder, what's one great memory or favorite thing about Groves? I'm in the old school. I would fantasize about jumping out of the window and running away. But here, I, I wanna come, I wanna see my friends. And something that happened kind of recently was I realized that I have a lot of really good friends and it just made me feel very happy. And I also realized that everybody here is like me. They're all going through a hard time and they're all here to help. And that was probably one of the happiest times when I realized that. Thank you, Wilder. Henry, you have the last word. We have about 25 seconds. Favorite thing or best memory, go. Um, the teachers and their understanding of my learning difficulties. Thank you for being so succinct. We're getting nice thank yous um, to all of our families and, and kids that are here today and our staff members. I'd like to thank you all for attending. We are here to answer questions. Reach out to admissions, that's your first stop. Um, but I think you've heard clearly from our families and our students and our administrative staff a, a little bit about who we are um, and how we serve uh, our students and these kids. So thank you so much, everyone be well. We look forward to interacting and communicating with you in the future.